From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studios uh, during these kind of crazy times uh, and, and really taking, taking a moment with the, uh, with the time that we have to reach out to some of the leaders in our community to, to give us some insight, to give us some advice, to share their knowledge about some of the things that are going on and some of the specific challenges that really the coronavirus and the COVID-19 uh, a situation are causing for all of us. So we're really excited to have CUBE alumni, haven't talked to him for a couple of years, uh, joining us from his house. He's Martin Mikos, the CEO of HackerOne. Martin, great to see you. Good to see you, Jeff. Good to be back, thank you. So first off, just a quick check-in. How are you doing? How are things going at HackerOne? How's the team doing? How are you guys kind of getting through this, uh, this, this time of, of difficulty? Well, we are fortunate in our company in that we have a business that's maybe doing even better in these times because we do security where you don't need to go into the office and we do it in a distributed way. So all of that is wonderful for, for the company. We do have our first positive case of, of COVID-19 in the company. He is now fully recovered after a few weeks. He's back at work. So it means means it came pretty close to us and we have others who might be in the danger zone, but overall we are doing very well and paying a lot of attention on health and staying safe and working from home and making sure we don't take risk because these are serious things that we shouldn't play with. Yes, well, I'm glad to hear that uh, that, that person is recovering. And I think, I think April is the month of six degrees of separation where all of us are going to know someone or someone who knows someone who's got this thing, is it? you know, kind of the, the curves, unfortunately, are still going up in the United States. So I don't think that's going to change. But uh, on a lighter note, one of the reasons I wanted to reach out to you is you've got a long history of working with distributed companies. You know, I, this, this COVID thing is kind of a forcing function around work from home and it never fails to amaze me how many people are on their first Zoom and they don't even know what WebEx is and they, they've never heard of Skype, you know? <laughs> and I think we, we get spoiled in the tech world. We use these tools all the time, but, but this is a forcing function. It's at the grade schools, the middle schools, the high schools, besides just regular companies. So when you were running uh, my MySQL back in the day, you had a distributed company, not only across uh, buildings, but across oceans and continents. So I wonder if you can share kind of, did that start that way? Did you move into that way? Kind of what are some of the early days as you move from everybody in the office to more of a distributed uh, network? Yeah, it did start that way at MySQL back in Scandinavia. and. Uh... When I joined, there were 12 people, everybody working from home. Um, the CTO lived just half an hour away from me, but we never saw each other. I worked from home, he worked from home. And I remember when I, as the new CEO, said that, hey, we will need an office. We need a headquarters where we can have meetings and uh, archives for contracts and stuff. And he said, no office over my dead body. It will kill the company culture. That was Why? the view That's of so the founders. progressive. Where, where did, where did that <laughs> yeah. view come from? Because that certainly was not the uh, you know kind of standard thinking. It, it was weird. It was back in that was two, year two thousand, and they had developed a way of working with open source uh, contributors all over the world over email and IRC back then, which is a predecessor to Slack, you could say. And they just developed that method of working together and making sure everything is digital, everything is written down, you are honest and forthright in writing as well. So it worked beautifully and, and they didn't like offices. We, we ended up having offices and we had many people working from the office, but, it, but there was nowhere, at no time was it more than 30% of our headcount of about 500 people who worked from home, or who worked from an office. 70% worked from home in 32 different countries across 16 time zones. Wow, what, that's very, very distributed. So um, in getting ready for this, I saw some other interviews that you've done and some other conversations on the topic. And one of the things that you brought up that I think is really topical is that this is really more of a, of a mental challenge um, than really a physical challenge. The tools are there, we have internet, you know, we're very fortunate that way. Didn't have these things in 2000 like we do today. But you talked about the mental challenge, both from a from a leadership perspective as well as maybe from the employee perspective. I wonder if you can dig into that a little deeper as as you you know kind of look at your peers that are treading into un, uncharted waters, if you will. Well, I think it's a it's a transition where you become one with the the medium, like with your laptop or whatever you're looking at, and you sort of you 
invest yourself in what you have in front of you and you give of yourself into it. Just like if somebody's taking a portrait of you with a camera, you have to sort of love the camera and show yourself to the camera for the portrait to be really, really good. Like that's what great photographers do. They get you to open up even though there's a, it's a machine and not another human being. And, and we have to develop this skill digitally to, to sit in front of a laptop or a phone or something and be our whole genuine selves showing all dimensions and aspects of our personality. Because we don't realize it, but when you go to an office, people are paying attention to how you walk, where you stop, how, what you look like, whether you look angry or happy, whether you look tired or not, when you go to the restroom, when you don't, like who knows all these things that people pay attention to that give you, give away how you feel and how you are. And then somebody may say, come and say, hey, Jeff seems to be in a bad mood today, or Jeff seems to be in a good mood today. And, and those are vital functions of a, of a group that works together. So you must allow the digital world to have the same. You have to bring that part of yourself into the digital realm and sort of open up. And, and people make the mistake that they just bring their professional selves. They just say, okay, what's the task? What's the work? Let's agree on something. Let's listen to everybody. And, and they don't leave, uh, reserve room for the social side and showing who you are. Because people won't ultimately trust you until they know that you are a human being and you have weaknesses and vulnerabilities and you can be silly and you sometimes you look good and sometimes you don't look good and sometimes you are to your advantage and sometimes you aren't. And unle until you've covered the whole range of your own expressions, you're not believable. Yeah. Another topic that that came up is, is is measurement, right? And KPIs, and how do you measure people's performance? And you know, it wasn't that long ago that that Ginny Rometty at IBM came out and said, you know, we don't want remote workers anymore. We want everybody to come check into the office. Well, you know, that that that's changed a little bit. But you know, you mentioned that you know we're so used to measuring things the way that we've always measured in the past. You know, are they there at eight? Do they stay till five or six? Do they look busy? As opposed to really focusing on outputs. And you talked about really shifting your mindset with a distributed workforce to make sure you're focusing on the right outcomes, not necessarily focusing on the things that maybe, as you said, as much as subconsciously you, you're paying attention to as much as anything. It's so easy to fake it in an office. I love you that. You go in there, you look busy, and people think you're amazing. <laughs> but when you work from home, you, uh, the only thing you have to show for is your work results. So it becomes much more objective. And of course, you have to you have to create metrics that can be tracked in a way that others can understand what you're doing. But but it actually makes it more straightforward because you can't fake it. Right, right. It's the only thing you can be measured by is what you you are actually producing. It's going to be interesting when we come out of this, right? Because there's a lot of psychology done around habits um, and and how things become habits and and the way things become habits is you do them for a while uh, in in sequence repeatedly, and then that becomes kind of part of your routine and. And before even here at theCUBE, right? Remote interviews were probably, I don't know, 5% of our, of our total output. Now they're going to be 100% for the foreseeable future. So as you look at kind of people that are new to this, this world of, of remote um, learning and remote working, it's going to be wild after they do this for a couple of weeks, hopefully get into the habit to then, as you said, in, in, in some prior things, this becomes the new normal and going to the office is the once every, every so often when we actually have to have a big team meeting or you know, some specific um, event. So you think this is going to probably be that tipping point to this becomes the new normal? I do think so. I think it will flip. So that now you, you may think that you and I are having a virtual conversation and it would be a real conversation if we were in the same room. That will flip. Soon this will be the real conversation. And if we meet in person, then it's an anomaly and that's the virtual thing. Right. Because most of the time we will connect like this and we will figure out ways to, to understand each other and know whether we can trust each other and sort of all these things will evolve on the digital side. And there's no reason why they wouldn't right. other than the, the reluctance of human beings to change their behavior. Inertia is a powerful thing. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's well, they say that first <laughs> we form habits then habits form us. There you go. And that's how it happens, that you've, you create some habit and then you become prisoner of that habit that you created and you can't get rid of it, but you just have to force yourself out of it. 
Right, and this is a forcing function uh, like none other in terms of this whole world. Exactly. So, so exactly. shifting gears a little bit to uh, mm -hmm. you know to kind of your day job beyond just leading, but actually um, worrying about security. RSA was the last big show we went to uh, late late January, early February. Um, all about security. Hacker One's all about security. I would imagine now that everybody's working from home and you know the pressure on on bring your own devices and and. We're seeing all this funny stuff about Zoom. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And now, of course, everybody's jumping on all the vulnerabilities, et cetera. What are you seeing in kind of the hacker world and security world as, as you know, there's huge shift uh, has moved to people working from home and remote uh, schools, et cetera? Well, it's clear that society now has to work from home and figure out distributed ways of, of getting education or work done. And as a result, criminality will go there as well. So we have to protect ourselves well. The first order problems is how do you protect yourself when you work from home? So then you talk about VPNs and how do you handle uh, credentials and authentication and multi-factor authentication to make sure that the connection is uh, authentic and, and protect. So that's the first one, the first order uh, challenge that we have now, right now going on. But on a little bit longer scale, we are seeing now companies deciding to start using cloud services even more than before, because they realize that this could come back. A situation like we are having now could come back and you will again be at home. And then they say, how do we build our software and IT infrastructure such that we are not needed in the office? And the answer is move to the cloud. So, and when you move to the cloud, you again, the security posture changes somewhat. You, you don't have to worry about network security anymore, but you do have to worry much more about AppSec, application security. So, so whatever happens here, they are useful transitions, but they will uh, put demands on security teams and business leaders to reevaluate what they spend money on in security. We are very fortunate at HackerOne to be on the winning side here, our service is exactly for this distributed virtual digital world. So we are needed even more every day, more and more because things are going online. But but companies will need to rethink those things and and stop spending on on things that don't make sense anymore. Yeah, it it, it is it is just wild, right? How this, this forcing function is is really making everybody evaluate things a little bit closer and pushing them through that inertia that before you could kind of put it off, put it off, put it off. You can't. You can't put it off anymore. Time's now. Right. Yeah. Well, we had a similar, like when Y2K happened, we also had a hard limit and we had to get stuff done. Now it's coming in a different way. Sort of the punishment came without announcement, but we are in a similar uh, a crunch to get it done. And we will. Yeah. But it will be difficult and it will put a lot of strain on people and the systems. But I do believe it's it's doable. Good. Uh, so I want to shift gears one last time um, mm -hmm. and talk really about yeah. open source. You know, you, you've built your right. career on, on open source. MySQL was obviously open source and and got bought by Sun eventually. Now, you know, part of Oracle's portfolio. Then you did Eucalyptus, um, that was open source, right? Eventually got bought by HP, and now HackerOne. You're using really a network of of of, uh, of hackers all over the world to really help deliver the service. So I'm just curious to get your take on on the role of open source. You know, it's been such a creative force. Uh, for development has been such a creative force for for kind of moving technology forward. How do you see it playing out now? What's the role of open source? Are you, are you seeing projects? Are you seeing you know people rallying around you know bringing the power of data and analytics and cloud to this problem? Because to me, I mean, there's clearly a human toll of people being sick, but it, but it's also a big data problem in terms of resource allocation and you know trying to sequence this thing and accelerate uh, vaccine development. You know, there's a lot of kind of big data. Uh, opportunities here to attack this thing? Uh, I think open source is even bigger now than it used to be. And it is a very powerful example of the fact that no matter how much we are threatened and we feel like we have to hunker down and isolate ourselves from others and foreign groups or people are dangerous, in reality, the biggest accomplishments in society are always about collaboration by large groups of really intelligent driven people and and because software is eating the world open source is eating the world and today if you don't use open source software you're just plain stupid so it has really taken over the whole world and it is now enabling all these new innovations and initiatives that we didn't do before in big data collecting big data analyzing data 
we see it in in the whole area of uh, DNA medicine where the researchers are sharing their findings with everybody. And that's very much like open source software. They don't call it open source software, but the the mechanisms are the same. Everybody is doing it for their own good, but by sharing it, they multiply the value of what they did and it speeds up innovation so that it outperforms anything done in a closed laboratory or a closed source company. So it's a wonderful, wonderful to sort of have been part of the open source revolution because it, has, it is spawning so many other uh, uh, initiatives and phenomena on a societal level. And this is just the beginning. It will go into politics, it go, will go into news, it will go into the assessment of fake news. Reddit is completely self-moderated. Uh, they don't hire the moderators. The moderators are, are provided by the community and they self-moderate. And understanding how to self-govern, self-moderate at very large scale, that's the key to, to success in many areas. So open source software is enormous, and yet it's just one little part of, of the whole world of community-driven innovation. Right, such a great lesson though, because you know, as we think back to kind of the last kind of national rally um, around say World War II, where you know, Kaiser started building ships and Ford was building, building airplanes, and, and we've got some of that going on with, with Elon Musk and people building respirators and some of these physical things, but, but there's this whole kind of software uh, and big data AI machine learning thing that's happening on the background you know, around the genome and, and the vaccine development that's not quite as visible, but really such an important part of this battle that we haven't seen. And then of course the other place, there's no place to hide. The fact that this is happening all over the globe at the same time to everyone, regardless of, of your religion, your politics, um, your geography, it's really um, a, a unique moment in time. Uh, hopefully one that we're not going to- It could be our best on. hope against coronavirus. The fact that the scientists are right now working together, sharing their findings, quickly going from one test to the next and figuring out what works. And mankind hasn't had that capacity before, but now we do. So we can't know whether it will take a long time or a short time, but at least we are getting all the resources uh, to bear and we we put them together and people share, right. which is what's dry, what's driving the innovation here. All right, Martin, I guess just a last kind of topic before before I let you go, you know, kind of circling fully back to leadership. One of the, the comments you talked about um, is about these types of times really favoring the bold. And I, I really like that line that is, you know, don't be scared. It's really an opportunity for the people who have it together and are making the right priorities to, to shine and, and to really kind of rise above the fray. I wonder if you can you know, share a little bit more of your thoughts about that as, as you know, from a leadership point of view, it's, it's a time of challenge, but it's really also a time of opportunity. Uh, I think it is, it, it's exactly like you said, it's like the, the Stockdale paradox, you know, Admiral Stockdale, who was a prisoner of war and over seven years and was tortured during those years and he, Every day he decided to, on one hand, be ready to face any brutal reality he might face, but on the other hand, never give up hope that one day he will come out and have no regrets, no, not looking back and be a free man again. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, we are not in as dire situation as he was, but society has a similar situation that we must have the courage to face the exact brutality of and the reality of coronavirus right now without thinking that it, that it, that we won't come out of it. We will absolutely come out of it. And we'll come out of it with innovations and new models that will outshine whatever we had before. And, and we must be able to maintain this duality of, okay, I'm ready to face the reality and I'm ready to be in isolation. I'm ready to use a face mask, whatever it takes. But I also, I will never give up hope about what will come once we come out of this. And with that mindset, as a company, as a family, an individual human being or a society, you can get through any problem. And this is what Admiral Stockdale taught us through his experience and by sharing it with everybody. Well, Martin, thank you for sharing that story and thank you for sharing your experience and, and, and kind of your point of view. We really appreciate it. You know, these are tough times and it's great to be able to look out the leaders and, and to kind of share the burden, if you will, 
uh, and hear from smart folks that, that have a point of view. So thank you very much for your time. Best to your employee. Glad uh, that person is recovering. And, and as you said, we will get through this and we'll, we'll come out stronger the other side. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Good thanks, Jeff Frick here signing off from the Palo Alto studios from theCUBE. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.